Welcome to the conversation on Big Cats. It's so wonderful to have you here. And I'm such a fan of what you've achieved at Jawai that I just had to have you talk about it so that people could understand what conservation and tourism could do together. It's one of the few really, really strong stories to come out of India. And it, it's just so important to to give a little background on Jaisal he's a very old friend of mine um, a member of the government's government of Rajasthan standing committee on wildlife and on the state board of wildlife Jaisal spent much of his childhood in Ranthambore and in 2000 formed Sujan which has some of the finest wildlife lodges and camps in India he strongly believes and follows a path for responsible tourism and the policy of giving back to the communities in which they have their lodges. He is also the vice president and member of the executive board of Relais and Chateau, the world's most prestigious collection of hotels and restaurants in 64 countries. He's uh, on the board of the Ranthambore Foundation and of course, he's a fantastic wildlife photographer. You're very Welcome. kind, Latika. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me on this. Um, so we really look forward to this presentation. Without um, further ado, let's go into the presentation and then we shall chat more. Right. So everything. I'm going to I'm going to pop it up on screen. So I'm I'm going to give uh, I <laughs> I had said to you, Latika, that I was going to keep my presentation short and talk a lot more, which yes. is really my usual characteristic but um, I've actually put together uh, along with a few of my research team um, a reasonably comprehensive presentation it's the first time we've done something like this uh, we have one for guests but uh, we interact a lot more with our guests so um, the presentations are usually smaller but I've, I've put in quite a lot I will go through some of them quickly so that I don't bore you uh, at, at any point um, what, what I've tried to do is give you a, a really in-depth uh, feel of of Jawai and I, I mean from history, geology, uh, and of course biodiversity. Um, Fantastic. The, the the culmination of all that is this phenomenal coexistence that we have, uh, mm -hmm. which is what we uh, uh, consider it our duty to preserve um, for the generations to come. So I'm going to start off. Uh, the first image you're looking at is actually a, a view of the Jawai Bands, but it's in the summer. So the, the, the water has receded quite a lot. Uh, the fields that you can see right near you are usually covered in water. Uh, and depending, some years when you've got a really good monsoon, uh, you know, they stay um, uh, submerged uh, for pretty much up until now. So here's a little table of contents. As I said, I'm going to give you a little brief uh, uh, perspective of, of all these bits. And I will end with, the, with a SWOT analysis and also a little video which is our camp video which will give you uh, an idea of, of what we do so this is the location as as you know but for the for the interest of all of those who aren't familiar with the region uh, we are ha sort of halfway between uh, jodhpur and and udaipur and we sit um, sort of very close to the kumbhalgarh national park which as you know is a is a fantastic wildlife habitat uh, it's also um, jawai is located not too far from the uh, Siroi Hills and from the Jalor Hills, uh, so actually forms quite a large, uh, potentially large wildlife habitat, uh, which is semi-agrarian, semi-pastoral, but also um, is has wildlife in it. Um, again, that's I've, I've already covered that distances from from where you are. Um, you know, on a map you can see uh, uh, quite clearly that it's almost equidistant. So this is actually the Jawai area and the area around the camp. It pretty much denotes the area we traverse. If you see the three little red um, chevron type thingies, uh, that's the location of the camp. And this entire area that you're looking at, as I said, is semi-agrarian, semi-pastoral, and semi-wild. So this is the this is uh, Jawai, um, a very high uh, concentration uh, of biodiversity in a relatively small uh, area. Uh, we've we've recorded over 30 mammal species, 65 flora, 270 bird species. It's amazing for 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 that, uh, both migratory and and residents, uh, amphibians and reptiles, and and this all exists. And I am giving you this relatively small area 
let's call it approximately 50 square kilometers. So, so very small. Uh, that's the population that resides within that area. Uh, 10,000 uh, odd people um, just in that sort of traversing belt. So, uh, you know, the landscape, uh, as you say, Jawai, uh, it um, takes its name from a seasonal uh, river which originates in the Aravalis. Uh, it, it runs a course of 96 kilometers before it joins uh, the Luni. And the dam um, that was created uh, to form that reservoir was, was just pre-independence. And we'll come to that. The geology, unbelievably beautiful uh, rock formations that are 850 million years old. Um, and the communities are also very, very important. Uh, a, a lot of uh, Rabadis, traditionally uh, a pastoral uh, community, they uh, actually, Jawa is one of the few places where they where they reside rather than just migrate through. Uh, wildlife, as I uh, mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, you know, a very rich biodiversity and we'll get to that. The predominant uh, economic activity in the area is agriculture. Um, and uh, the land is very fertile, especially because the Jawai River brings with it fantastic soil uh, from uh, the Kumbhalgar Hills. A little historical perspective, um, you know, it's, it's, as I said, halfway between Jodhpur and Udaipur. There have been many um, uh, little battles between those two kingdoms back in uh, medieval India. Uh, the original tribes that lived there, the Bhils and the Minas, live in those hills, uh, still inhabit the area. Uh, and from Jawai, actually, you can see uh, the top of Kumbhalgar, which was, of course, founded by Rana Kumbha. There's a Mughal influence there. Um, uh, as you will see in 1586, Akbar, to confirm the marriage of Prince Salim, uh, granted the province of Godward, which had been annexed by uh, Mughal forces to uh, Marwar, to the Jodhpur uh, royals. And it's not far where the you know, epic battle of Haldi Ghati was fought. Uh, you know, I will I will leave some of this for for you to read and flip through. Here's the uh, reservoir again. It was in the mid 40s that Maharaja Umaid Singh Ji of Jodhpur uh, commissioned the building of the dam. And I think this single activity has uh, been the um, sustenance that biodiversity needed to thrive in that in that area. I think this is the most important element of the of the area so here we have another view this is slightly more uh, uh, during the monsoon uh, early monsoon the domestic uh, animals that of course come with the human population have now become part of the natural prey base uh, and and i'll come to that later but um, it's amazing that we don't have uh, man animal conflict because of uh, this particular reason um, in Jawai, and it's quite an astounding uh, fact. You know, the hills of Jawai are a catchment, predominant um, uh, crops, wheat, castor, mustard, sesame, chickpea, cotton, variety of lentils. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, the topography is a combination of scrubland uh, with patches of human settlements, farm, water bodies, seasonal riverbeds, uh, amazing cave network. And here's the here's the geological overview. So Jawai's topography, these these phenomenally beautiful copies, as they call them in Africa, uh, hillocks, uh, as we refer to them more in India, um, they are basically granite and igneous rock. Um, they are slightly younger than the Aravallis. Uh, we had a little bit of a geological survey conducted and a report made by a geologist some years ago. Um, that showed them to be about 850 years old and part of the Malani group of uh, basalt outcrops. So these provide amazing uh, shelter and camouflage for uh, the apex predator, which is the leopard, but also house uh, and are home to a lot of smaller animals, as you'll see. Lovely shelf life, shelf like structures like this, uh, and you get to see leopards in this amazing sort of setting. And I will. I'm, I won't go through every word, Latika. Otherwise, we'll be we'll be going through the presentation for hours. This amazing weathering that takes place. Uh, interesting to note that it's not uh, like this area was submerged uh, underwater, and that's what caused it. But actually, um, a lot of it is is formed through very very 
a slow uh, seepage of, of, of underground water. So I've quoted here from, from our geological study that we carried out there. And flora, interesting, uh, you know, I'd given the historical perspective, the boundary, the unofficial boundary between the kingdoms of Marwad and Mewad was this particular uh, aula, uh, this beautiful little plant with yellow uh, uh, flowers. And uh, so that where you actually start to see this particular plant is where Mewad begins. And the Baulia, which is Prosopis juliflora, uh, is where Marwad actually begins. So this area has both of them. So it's it's sort of been disputed uh, many a time. And some of the local chieftains actually had seats in both the kingdoms of, of Marwad and Mewad. The lovely example of a uh, Butea monosperma, flame of the forest. So 70 species of indigenous flora have been uh, recorded by our team. Uh, there's a lot of euphobia, um, as, as it says there, um, locally known as Thord, and um, it's technically arid scrubland. Um, we have some amazing uh, bank, banyan and people trees, uh, which are beautiful, but they are not as abundant as you would find them in Ranthambo, for example. So as I said, Jawa is a unique ecosystem which is semi-pastoral, semi-agrarian and semi-wild. Uh, the metapopulation of several species with Panthera pardus fusca technically at its apex. Uh, and it's a rare example of coexistence where all of this thrives with the 10,000 odd people who live uh, in that area. It's connected, interestingly, uh, Latika to the Kumbhalgarh National Park is very, very close. Uh, and these are loose connections, the Siroi Abu Hills and the Jalor Hills and I'll show you on a map, uh, there we are. So Jawai obviously in the center there, uh, Jalor Hills off to the left and there's, there's further maps which will show you exact uh, distances. Here you are. So this um, is, uh, is an interesting map um, and, and even though I've mentioned it later in the presentation, you know, this is uh, really uh, an opportunity here to create a fantastic wildlife corridor, uh, at least joining Abu Sirohi through the Jawai Dam into Kumbhalgarh uh, Sanctuary. Uh, I do believe and our field team believes that there is a migration that takes place uh, of uh, certainly leopard uh, between these areas. Um, sadly, we haven't been able to prove that yet, um, but it's something we're working on because it will involve a camera trapping uh, exercise with the government of Rajasthan. So this is the area we generally traverse. This is uh, the bit that hosts about 10,000 people, maybe a little more actually uh, in terms of people, but this is the area we loosely traverse. Um, what we have done, uh, interestingly, is uh, we have uh, either bought certain land, rented certain land. Uh, some of our friends have, have given land uh, and this uh, direct land under conservation is 279 acres. So that is absolutely private and, and, and sort of inviolate. But having said that, I believe that our influence there, where we are able to conserve and protect species, is this entire green belt that we have called the Jawai Traversing Area in this. Little uh, few photographs, images of what we call the Keystone Megafauna over there, Indian Marsh Crocodile, quite a healthy population of them in the Jawai Reservoir. Uh, leopard, of course, uh, Langurs, um, Nilgai, We've interestingly found the population of both Nilgai and wild boar has actually risen in the last five to seven years. Golden jackal and uh, hyena. A little bit on, on, on the leopard. And of course, the extraordinarily high population density um, is, is, is an interesting aspect of, of Jawai. Uh, we've documented 67 individual leopards. Of course, there have, has been mortality in that uh, figure. Um, but as I mentioned earlier when I was showing you the map, the leopards of Jawai are part of a larger metapopulation between Jawai, Kumbhalgarh, uh, Siroi, Abu and Jalor. So one animal per three square kilometers is unusually high, I think, for pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, and these are leopards that are seen, I do believe, and I've heard reports from Africa that, that uh, in certain areas there are very high densities, but you don't see the animal. Uh, I don't know whether anyone's done any camera trapping of such areas in Africa, but over here uh, we have found that it, it, and it can be even less than this as I will uh, go on. And I think uh, we believe that the, the network of caves and crevices uh, allow for 
uh, populations to coexist because they they are able to go into their own nooks and crannies uh, so to speak lesser cats of jawai so we've got uh, asiatic wild cat uh, and uh, jungle cat and also uh, you know something rare the rusty spotted cat so which is the smallest uh, cat i think that we have uh, in in asia striped hyena uh, lovely hyena dens you know we we sometimes go 6 8 months without seeing any but then we you know chance upon and our trackers chance upon a hyena den and uh, and and these are some lovely images in fact my last uh, visit to jawai i had a lovely sighting of a pair of uh, hyenas who were courting we didn't photograph the mating but they were they were very much together this is of course uh, something phenomenal the indian wolf and and these these animals have been decimated you know in india especially during the british raj but even after and we have documented them uh, at jawai sadly there's not enough uh, data on them in the area this is something that i want to make a priority to actually find out more about where they're migrating from and to uh, where they're denning uh, and so on and so forth um, we we have transient animals that keep coming through and um, uh, as you've seen uh, here uh, you know 200,000 were killed between 1875 and 1925 which which i think completely battered the population little bit of information that we we got was uh, you know a 2000 to 3000 indian wolves uh, live in india um, so you know while we pay a lot of attention to tigers uh, and 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 big cats i think this is something that uh, that does require uh, political will and intervention to save the indian wolf so a little video i'll play for you it's not no sound so it's just to show you love and this is literally not even I think 300 meters away from from the Jawai leopard camp, you know, completely at ease. As you can see, they don't look uh, too bothered. With uh, it was just one vehicle with with one of our trackers in in it. Um, yeah, a Bengal fox, um, charismatic little uh, Canada, and again, one problem that persists across India, and it's probably a very unpopular thing to say, but feral dogs, uh, and and a solution really does need to be found for for that. you know absolutely wax species like this uh, i i believe that they also uh, you know will take out wolves and um, uh, hyenas and hyena dens as well and eventually i think the leopard will also suffer from from feral dogs so that is a that is a a, a big problem that we need to uh, address across india flamingos um so yeah coming to our 270 odd uh, avian species the sarus crane uh, in fact i've uh, personally witnessed up to 150 a flock of 150 which is which is amazing and uh, yeah i i tend to even though we've said they typically arrive in november and fly fly back to cooler climes in the peak of summer i've in fact seen them uh, you know even in may uh, at jawai owls so there you are rarely seen some of them uh, like this the short ear and in 2018 we uh, recorded the presence of an albino peacock our resident uh, researcher there uh, suggests the presence of a morph in the gene of the peafowl population everyone concentrates on all, all the big stuff and one of the things that i've been pushing our team to do more and more is concentrate on on microfauna so you know here this was in camp we were all having drinks and someone came and said oh my god uh, there's a scorpion uh, with a uh, with a lizard a gecko and uh, sorry and um uh, my wife sort of ran off there and uh, got this uh, photograph as i mentioned earlier the jawai band has a has a reasonably large population of the indian marsh crocodile but uh, we've had we've got the spiny headed fan throated lizard uh, the saw scale viper is quite common the star back tortoise we've also we also get a common crate uh, uh, which which is as you well know very very venomous there's the racer and a star tortoise and again uh, you know one of the most trafficked uh, uh, species um, and here coming to the coexistence so apart from you know the enviable biodiversity we have in india we have these amazing uh, uh, communities who who have survived and and thrived alongside wildlife um, the rabaris being one of them uh and the coexistence here between uh, all the predators uh with the leopard at the apex 
and the locals is is what's really astounding and it's amazing that we have not had any incidents of man animal conflict uh, where you know it, with such high densities in 170 years and it's also interesting to note that the neighboring district of Rajasamand has one of the highest uh, man leopard conflicts in Rajasthan so you know it's it's again uh, food for thought and 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 things to to research so our, uh, we aside from our field team that shows our guests around we also have a resident researcher who's full time on research but our emphasis even with our field team has been conservation first and that and that is a guiding principle of what we do uh, so we've uh, we've collected uh, raw data from day 1 uh, you know we we have gps coordinates for them we've also had one of your fellow uh, panelists on this uh, very kindly uh, you know advising us uh, from time to time dr kostab sharma uh, you know on how we should go about this because you know at the beginning we were completely at sea saying you know what is the data we should be collecting so you know he he said look this is the basic stuff that you should do um, which which we've been following and obviously also dr dharmendra kandal has been uh, uh, you know advising us from time to time on 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 things like this so every single wilderness drive that we conducted jawai uh, they record uh, sightings of of all sorts of things that they see uh, it all comes in and 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 is put in a put in a mainframe in the computer and then of course we have a camera trap program uh, which as you can see uh, it spans about 80 square kilometers 17 uh, field team members including biologists wildlife rescue and rehabilitation experts and the eight trackers that we draw from local communities who've been trained uh, by us um, and and these, this team it's interesting to note even when the camp is closed as in now the team continues to operate so this just a map showing uh, you know the leopard uh, movements generally around around the area with all the ones that we have actually identified and got on our records our camera trap program again has been a great success we've got all sorts of interesting um, uh, footage from it if you look at the the one on the left very interesting a wild boar walking with a leopard literally behind it um, and and it got away and then porcupines we've got we we, we get them very often uh, and and hyenas as you can see to the right so porcupines as i mentioned we have a stable population of them uh, and uh, asiatic wildcat um, this is very interesting these images were taken over one hour and 25 minutes at the same location they show four independent adult leopards passing the same camera trap uh, between 351 and 516 uh, in the morning on the 18th of january 2018 and all four continue to overlap this territory and this is the porcupine and leopard and a water hole so the, the entire area uh, that you saw in the green in the map where we traverse the rabaris and the local communities have these little water points for generally for their cattle uh, dotted around the the area so just again camera trap data uh, just shows you what we've been getting on it interesting to note that we, we we've uh, we've got 602 captures of indian hair uh, traditionally this entire area you know hair was uh, hunted uh, mercilessly uh, and 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 the population has come back so this is a example of a of a uh, id card that we have for for all our uh, leopards so it shows both the flanks the face and a little information and 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 territory we use this to interact with our guests as well as you can see uh, in the text the uh, a report on megafauna density and landscape survey was in 2016-17 we did a geological survey in 14-15 um, we have uh, responded to emergency calls in by local villagers from 2015 to today we've had 35 animals safely rescued the field book uh, has as uh, you know is added to every year with with all the new things that we discover um, so I, as i mentioned from day one from 2013 we've documented every sighting and uh, on the right the rosette pattern id slides for every leopard so the density of wild prey species uh, obviously is comparatively low when you look at uh, and compare it to a national park however i do believe and we we yet have to conclude proper studies on this that the leopards not only uh, eat uh, you know dogs and and also 
um, while uh, uh, and also cattle but also uh, thrive on things like the monitor lizard uh, and a lot of smaller uh, mammals that they are able to catch and birds so as you can see these are just some uh, bits of information that we uh, an analysis uh, from our from our camera traps and and from our data that we collect as i mentioned feral dogs is a is a is a big threat to the to the area and and, and we will chat about that so this is another interesting um, happening you know we we find that the cubs in uh, in jawai seem to to uh, wean uh, much quicker or get wean much quicker than than in other wildlife habitats and uh, again you know perhaps this has occurred in other places but we haven't had any uh, such information uh, uh, and we we'd love to know more if someone does and this is a little case study so this is perva it's an isolated hillock um it's a few kilometers away from uh, from us there is a village surrounding almost three sides of it and it has a sort of wild jord on one side uh so within this we have i think at at max we've documented 13 uh, leopards living in this little uh space of course as i said they have migrated and they do migrate um but i will show you a very interesting video this is in perwa i mean this is almost like a pride of leopards So that was uh, that was actually taken way back I think in 2013 or 2014. So the the last uh, case uh, recorded was 170 years ago where there was any serious man animal conflict or leopard uh, leopard man conflict in uh, the Jawai area. Um and that I mean especially with the video you've just seen is is extraordinary because you know you've got the temples that those steps lead up to the temples the the priest goes up and down and in fact i have a picture that was published in my book of the priest walking down those very stairs and a leopard sitting watching him from not very far away in broad daylight no worries at all 
uh, so that's uh, quite extraordinary so conservation tourism is 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 the core of what we do at at sojan um, and of course uh, wildlife has a lot to do with that um, i believe uh, that tourism done the right way uh, which gives back um, and gives back sustainably not in fits and starts um, is a model that can be a key partner in conservation globally so we we do a lot of things local so we and we always have and this is something we've done for 20 years and we we've, we've we've built upon it at jawai uh, more than uh, you know we even thought we'd be able to you know we source our wheat locally we and we source our wheat at jawai for all our properties even the ones that aren't in jawai because we find that the wheat there um, is is not only of a very high quality but uh, the locals don't use pesticides and don't use chemicals and we've actually encouraged them to to go completely organic and buy their entire um entire yield so you know constant interactions with with the locals and the communities and i think uh, that is another very very important uh, aspect of conservation if you have the communities on side you know the the chances of poaching trapping illegal wildlife trade are reduced if not negated so we do a holistic village development program uh, in sena Uh, Jeevda and Minoki Dhani I've given the details here I leave them there for you to read uh, education we've adopted 11 sorry 13 schools in Rajasthan from our uh, guest receipts alone and that's it it's it's the the guests coming through that fund all our programs of course we contribute as a family to them so when it comes to capital investment uh, like what I'm going to show you next like the medical van my wife and i donated the van which was obviously a considerable expense fully kitted out um and donated it to to the cause but the day to day running of it the doctor's salary the nurse's salary the driver's salary the, the uh, fuel and medicines completely free uh, paid for through guest receipts that are mandatory so for everyone who stays at our property uh, and at any of our properties they uh, have to pay a a conservation contribution that goes directly and entirely to conservation be it with the community or directly to wildlife so obviously you know th- this these are these are you know no brainers for us plastic reduction uh, you know we we're, we're trying to work now with our suppliers to say we're not going to accept anything that you give us in a plastic uh, bag or sealed in a plastic pouch or any such thing so uh, while that will take a little bit of time we're already on it um uh, at camp ourselves we don't we don't use uh, there's definitely no single use plastic so organic farming as i told you um is one of the things we've pushed and i think we've done quite well at it uh, we've we've had an amazing yield of mustard oil this year completely organic and obviously when our guests come they're eating farm to table uh, solar is a big uh, is a big push now uh, you know we run a lot of what we run at camp on solar and our rewilding project so i mean if you if you look at these two images uh, as well uh, i think this was within a year uh, the 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 change in in the uh, in that particular area but we have 279 i'd say call it approximately 300 acres uh, that have become inviolate uh, wildlife habitats as a sort of haven for wildlife that we do traverse but nothing else happens there as the camp as you can see it was a it was a field when we bought it uh, you know it's a thriving uh, little ecosystem of its own uh, and as low impact as we can have it everything that you see comes off and uh, is packed away the camp is seasonal it operates for 8 uh, months of a year and as i mentioned the conservation contribution you know we charge uh, every single guest and and we've raised uh, you know well over a quarter of a million us uh, dollars from from this um there are some guests and this is just the mandatory contribution i'm saying there are guests who come and say here is uh you know up to <laughs> our our biggest donation which we haven't actually taken because we're waiting for the correct project to use it in a guest came and said i will give you i guarantee you half a million dollars so you know when guests actually see the work on the ground experience it then they don't mind actually uh, putting uh, more money into into that a quick uh, swot analysis swot analysis these are the strengths obviously of of the area there will be others uh, we just put this uh, down uh, yesterday 
you know, the pastoral wildlife balance. Uh, there's no major industry in the area. Local communities are reasonably protective of wildlife. Um, there are multiple reasons for this, uh, uh, religious, cultural, social, but also economic where uh, government does give compensation. Sadly, it's erratic and so we've also put it, uh, you'll see it further. There are great big grazing lands uh, and sacred groves that provide natural habitat and cover. Uh, the government has tried to uh, limit uh, mining in this area. Uh, in fact, tried to ban mining in this area. Certain bits have been declared a conservation reserve. Uh, so hillocks that were owned by the forest department. Um, so they've added a little bit to that ecosystem. This is to small land holdings. So unlike Africa, where you can go in certain countries and, and put down 100,000 hectares under wildlife and protected and, and so on and so forth. Here, that's legally not possible. It's also a nightmare, even if government does give you permission, because the land holdings are tiny. Um, so those are some weaknesses. Feral dogs is, is, is there. Uh, opportunities so that, you know, uh, Contiguous habitat linking Kumbalgarh uh, through to, to those other two, uh, both Jalor, if you really want to be adventurous, but certainly to the Siroi Abu employment. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, this area can sustain uh, ethical tourism operations. Uh, sadly, you know, that is uh, something that is proliferating where, you know, unchecked tourism has already started knocking on Jawai. And, and that, is a, that is a concern, as you'll see. So the threats, uncontrolled tourism, as I just mentioned, people are conducting unethical, unregulated tourism. Uh, they don't even have permissions. Uh, and uh, it's not like they're doing it in a, in a non-obtrusive way. There are some who are actually causing uh, serious disturbance to the area. And, uh, and, and that will need to get addressed. Rock mining is an issue. It's been traditionally done. Uh, certain governments in the past have given licenses. Uh, thankfully, we have uh, in the last five years not seen any serious mining activity in the area. This is a problem across India, I presume, and across the world. You know, people uh, putting impediments to the natural flow of, of uh, water. You know, people will see a dry riverbed and say, oh, there's no water in this and, you know, construct on it or, or mess around with it. And they don't realize that that is the catchment. So there's a lack of education uh, in matters, ecological you know, across the world and certainly in, in our area. Uh, and overgrazing is a threat. Uh, it's not a huge problem at the moment, but but going forward, unless again, we're able to educate and convince and work with the local communities to, to ensure that, uh, you know, they adhere to a sort of carrying capacity of heads of cattle, uh, uh, there will be an issue going forward. Uh, chemical fertilizers issue again, uh, consumption of that, that has reduced, but but there is still, I'm sure, in the area, uh, certainly not around camp because they, they know we're very vigilant, but certainly further away from us, there could be stuff that's still going on. Um, the inconsistent uh, compensation. So sometimes you get a good officer and you get political will and boom, compensation is paid. And that was the case for many years. Uh, it's a bit erratic at the moment. And, and again, it's something that we hope to work closely with the Rajasthan Forest Department in, in rectifying. Uh, this last point, big, big problem, railway track connecting Ahmedabad and Jaipur, and it's cutting through the Kambeshwar Wildlife Sanctuary. So uh, sort of west, uh, west and northwest of the, of the actual water reservoir. And yeah, that's, that's what we believe in, a sustainable, inclusive conservation tourism model that benefits wildlife, local communities, while remaining a responsible, profitable and to end a last little bit of video.
Fantastic. First, congratulations. I think this is probably the first time there has been a conservation tourism operation that has been world standard and definitely at par with what I've seen all over the world now. And uh, Thank you, well, Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, you know, coming back to some conversations we've been having over the past few days and, and now looking at the railway line, it all comes back to mind. When are we going to actually be able to implement any sort of planning regulations in areas like this, in areas like Ranthambore, to prevent really unnecessary, unwarranted proliferation of unsustainable architecture and unsustainable human habitation? How are we going to do this? So, uh, you know, very, very pertinent uh, question, uh, Latika. I, I think, the, the, and I'll start by saying this, I think the, is the most essential ingredient in the conservation process is political will. That, without that, you can have all the money in the world, all the expertise in the world, all the good intentions in the world to actually implement them and for them to fructify. There is no way you can do that without political will. So that is that is the first. Uh, when will we do this? I, uh, you know, I as as you mentioned, I'm on the standing committee of the Rajasthan governments uh, for wildlife, and and on the wildlife board. And one of the things I I, I meant to look at along with my committee is is things like this. Um, I'm not a believer uh, in saying no development at all because it's unrealistic, and there are many enough conservation fraternity. Who say no, 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 no? This is ridiculous. There cannot be a road here or whatever. And and I I believe that both uh, development uh, that aids the economic development of, of countries like ours uh, can happen in a sustainable, responsible way. It may cost a little more. It may take a little bit of time. But yes, there is a way that we could actually have both these things go hand in hand: development and uh, the sustainability and the protection of our wild habitats and our biodiversity. I, I don't think uh, that uh, either of these things will compete with one another. Obviously, they'll compete a little bit. Uh, let me clarify. Actually, yes, they will compete a little bit. But I think they can both uh, happen side by side. And, and, and it just takes a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of patience and application where we're not just rushing into building a road or a railway track without thinking. I mean, this freight corridor coming around Jawai, uh, if you ask me, and I, it's already done, it has nothing to do with me. It's not like I'm going to be uh, reviewing it or any such thing. But I would have said, you know, put it up, put it under, make a make an underground tunnel, whatever the most ecological way of, of doing it uh, would have been. And I think that is something that requires political will and, and convincing of our political class that, look, you can have development, you can build expressways, you can build railway lines, you can do X, Y, and Z, but you, if you do it like this, with, in a responsible way, uh, it may cost a little more, as I said, it may take a little more time, but it can happen and you don't damage the environment or don't so damage just, it as much. There's always you, going to be a little bit of damage to the environment, okay? I mean, we can't yeah, no, be no, unrealistic. No. I'm a realist, yes. so let me, let me, let me. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering whether like-minded people, like everybody who's got together for this con conversation, we could actually start a campaign to educate our politicians because we've never thought of doing that before. We've thought of raising the opinion of the common people. We've thought of petitioning the Supreme Court. We've thought of, uh, you know, working with school children, but we've never really thought of doing something that only targets the political community. I I, I think I think it's a very fair point. Um, uh, I, I think it is it is the most important thing for us to do because it is it is the politicians who actually pass legislation. They are uh -huh. the ones who are in, in administrative control of the country, and if we don't have them on side and unable and, and able to understand what what we're trying to say, you know, I, I find that a lot of the times we approach politicians as conservationists. Uh, or as responsible tourism operators or whatever you call it, it's always a reactive measure. You know, something happens and we all go knocking on every door and saying, oh, no, 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 you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that. And you, so the politician generally hears, you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that. Uh, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I think the time's come that we, a bunch of us should make a concerted effort 
to to actually go and say actually we've not come because of anything but hey look if you build an express way and you do it like this rather than doing it like that you're going to have the express way you're going to have environmental credentials you're going to be able to save the ecosystem uh, and uh, enhance biodiversity and and you know when when you put it like that we will also as conservationists have to be a little real and say okay we are going to lose a little bit but what is that little bit and and is it okay to lose now obviously you know if you're going to build a, a railway track uh, which goes over the chambal river for example and it's going to go right over the the nesting grounds of the gharial no that's not good but if you crossed over 20 kilometers further and it cost you 150 crores more it's worth it's more than worth, worth it worth 150 crores yeah. right yeah yeah so 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 we will still potentially say oh it's you know skimmers might get affected x or y <laughs> might happen but we we say actually okay you build a cantilever bridge or whatever i'm not a, i'm not an yeah. engineer yeah. but you, yeah. you you build something that is the most eco friendly that doesn't stop water flow and so on and so forth and then that's yeah. uh, fine yeah yeah okay so i been you know at over the last um two weeks i've been talking intensively with friends in the community and there are three points which stuck really struck uh, out from the conversation in my mind one was when kostub sharma was talking and one of the most interesting things he said was that one in one of the ecosystems where he was working the the grazers were not earning a huge amount of money from the actual cattle or from tourism connected with snow leopard but the services they were getting from the ecosystem that was being maintained by the conservation of the the snow leopard amounted to close to $18,000 a year per person wow now if we start quantifying ecosystem services in areas like jawai to be able to explain to our politicians in a new way what exactly the the benefit of maintaining this this habitat is it might be a way of breaking through and and talking so maybe now we need to actually get people to start giving us these numbers and quantifying so All very of valid point and i i i completely agree uh, ladika i think uh, uh, it was dave uh, david varty uh, who uh, is one of the owners of the londlozi game reserve and founder of it dave actually has always uh, talked to me about the economy of wildlife and by by that he means you know you're a non um, invasive and extractive uh, industry and and so if tourism can benefit an area bring in conservation money improve the ecosystem uh, it's a win win for everyone no one loses absolutely uh, so 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 that is that is something that you know again it's it's in in jawai uh, will a farmer earn more from cultivating at the banks of the jawai river uh, uh, the banks of the jawai reservoir uh, caster or will he make more saying actually i'm just going to leave it wild uh, and um, you know traversing it is going to earn me x uh, so we yeah, we well, predict to a reserve like like the mara north for example yeah so another interesting thought i wanted to um, to to share with you yesterday i was talking to vidya atriya who's done okay. a lot of work um studying leopards i think she was saying that um leopards and humans actually share the same space and but they they share it at different times of the day so agricultural fields and cultivation actually form a part of the habitat that leopards use very easily so we don't have to stress so much on on whether that affects them or not and in fact because there are large rodents and other um animals coming into these fields they actually provide a good place for the leopards to hunt she's absolutely by the way so she's absolutely right it's it's in in jawai especially there are areas where there are fields and i used an example of caster and i said caster versus uh, traversing you can have both and we've had that in the last yes. season yes. you have you have roads going through yes. um, and uh, in fact what what has happened at jawai 
is even during game drive hours so to speak early morning late evening within natural light uh, we've now had leopards comfortable with vehicles walking quite happily yeah. through and as the as long as the farmers are, are aware of that uh, i think then you've got a triple whammy you've got the caster you've got yes. you've got the happy farmer you've got the happy tourist and you've got the happy lodge operator and yes. and, 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 and the happy the, government because you've got your agricultural produce going as yes. well yeah and then the other interesting thing that came out of her study for me which is you know again something that i really thought about is that she said that leopards in and humans have traditionally cohabited space so the very fact that you're talking about raja saman and jawai being neighboring areas means that it's not the leopards that are at fault it's actually something we are doing that isn't right that's disturbing the 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 equation and and turning it so that leopards are reacting in the way that they react yeah and i mean that is that has been shown and it it, it it's i i think there was a study in maharashtra and maybe down south um yeah she did the maharashtra one maybe it was one. hers maybe it was hers yes, yes, where yes. where if you brought in an element of poaching and shooting the animal yes. obviously behaved differently so yes. you can apply the same thing to other human activity that has probably prompted the leopards of rajasthan to actually be more uh, aggressive towards human Absolutely. threats Absolutely. and so, the yeah, third I mean, it's a possibility yeah yeah and the third very interesting thing which she said which i just think you'll find interesting is that there was a female that had been collared and removed from the area a uh, translocated not because she was a man eater because there had been any conflict but merely because people had seen her too often in the village and started to get worried so she had never attacked humans there had never been any cases of conflict but she was picked up and translocated to the edge of madhya pradesh and when she was released there she turned into a man eater and they so, believe the stress of the translocation so again her into this yeah now trans translocation is is a whole is 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 a big uh, is, a Pandora, is a pandora's box but i i will i i'll give you my little bits on on that uh, completely believable uh, we've seen that happen with tigers as well um i am of the firm opinion that unless you have to tra uh, uh, tranquilize an animal don't mm -hmm. uh, use every it should literally be last resort uh, you know we've had instances uh, and i have i have requested numerous Uh, politicians and government officials forest officials to not be invasive with wildlife uh, to not interfere with wildlife uh, you know i i believe be it tranquilizing baiting uh, all cause big issues I, i also believe that baiting animals contributes also to uh, to this uh, yes. you know feeding them uh, we've had instances Uh, and i won't get into details where you know officials have felt that a particular tiger may be uh, injured or unable to kill and oh let's uh, you know feed it artificially and have thrown out a uh, a baby buffalo from the back of a jeep now the tiger will then start associating jeep food buffalo and you know a person falls out of a jeep or doesn't even fall out of a jeep is sitting in the jeep and eventually you know you can potentially have a very tricky situation on your hands so translocation and 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 interference in with animals there's one thing responsibly observing them uh, you know it's not like animals don't come near near vehicles and 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 some of the pictures we see when anyone wants to slam wildlife tourism is uh, you know a bunch of tourists standing up in a jeep tiger walking right next to them and people are like oh my god look to this disturbing the tiger absolute bollocks tiger walked through the tourist okay. not the tourist walked to the tiger yeah. okay so, yeah. so 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 and and who's to explain to you know a million readers of of the times of india or whichever uh, newspaper yeah. may carry them to say hey 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 actually the jeeps are parked on the road and the tiger walked out of the jungle right through the jeeps and the other side and then someone will say oh well it blocked its path well there was tons of place for it to take five steps it's not like a human being that it's oh that's my driveway and i'll go by it that's not how an animal thinks and th these things are very difficult to explain to 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 the common man but yeah. i do believe that if you start to mess around tranquilizing uh and and things like this you are asking for trouble and while 
translocations have been successful if you note and i have not a, i'm not a scientist and and i i have not done a study on this but my hunch just using my field experience of the last whatever 40 years of my life i would say that animals that have been translocated will potentially be more dangerous to humans than a wild population and yes. and i would say this as a general rule of thumb with big cats across the world there have yes. been successful translocations like i mean the fact is uh, you know ranthambore has given tigers to sirisca and and so on but those tigers may have been translocated once and if the translocation has been done well uh, and handled properly we haven't seen an issue great so i think um this has been amazing and i think um maybe we should do a hashtag educate our politicians campaign yeah. well and 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 not not in a reactive way we should do it no. in a proactive way proactive like, way you know, going yeah. yes yeah yeah okay yeah. wonderful thank you so much i mean that presentation was beyond what i expected it was really it's such a fantastic um you know summary of everything that you are doing and um you know really wishing you all the best um with these projects thank you very much radhika thank you for having me on your on your uh, webinar and uh, we hope to see you soon and in the yes. field absolutely yes take care bye bye thank you bye bye they are they are a symbol of our reverence of our fascination uh, and of our uh, uh, fondness of what's out there in nature